Good afternoon. Thanks for bearing with us. Um, it's such an honor to be here because um, the porter was unknown to me until about two years ago. Um, so it's really, so I came as like this little meat grad student two years ago, you know, just introducing myself. Um, so to be here today, particularly presenting after Kimberly Camp and being also a staff member at PAFA is like so serendipitous for me, it's not funny. <laughs> um, so because of time, I'm gonna really try to be really, really quick. Um, what I really wanted to do today was to kind of point out, um, honestly, the PAFA doesn't have an archive of African-American um, that can really, of African-American artists, um, or that can really kind of help us dig into this conversation the way that we, the way that I think or the way that we think that it should. Um, because PAFA has really trained many of the great African-American artists um, from the 19th century forward. Uh, but we do have paintings, you know, our, our permanent collection, um, and other ways that we can kind of go about, as uh, Dr. Buick and Dr. Smalls mentioned earlier, like getting, kind of getting at um, our histories. And I'll start by saying that most of the time when people talk about PAFA and African-American artists, you know, the story is always Tanner. The story always starts with Tanner. Um, but the story's not always told truthfully. Um, it's not always con contextualized accurately. Um, and when I got to PAFA, something that I found really interesting, because I was coming as a graduate student from a black studies program, so I was very familiar with Robert Douglas Jr. Um, and very familiar with James Porter's you know, modern Negro art and his research on Douglas. Um, so when I got there, and there was really no record of Douglas other than the piece that we showed in 1834, I started to do a little digging. Um, and what I came up with was our famous Benjamin West painting, Penn's Treaty. Now Penn's Treaty with the Indians, um, Benjamin West, let me give you a bit of background there. So Benjamin West was the second president of the World Royal Academy of London. Um, he was an honorary member of PAFA's board um, because he was living abroad, but he was from the Philadelphia area. Um, and this is one of our gems of, of, of Benjamin West's paintings. He's a famous you know, American history painter. Um, and what I found out was that the Delaware Indian tribe, Robert Douglas's grandmother, descended directly um, from this tribe. So continue to dig around, um, and I find out that she married Cyrus Bastille. Um, who was a baker in the Continental Army, um, first black millionaire in, or one of the first you know, black millionaires in Philadelphia, um, and a light kind of went off. You know, and I was saying, um, here's a painting you know, that's central you know, to Philadelphia history, um, to Pathos history, that's also very central to the history of African Americans in this in this city, but you would never know that. Um, and so when I started asking around, you know, and people at, at Path and people were saying, "Oh, you know, you you were saying that you were in, you know, investigating that painting, researching that painting." I really didn't think you would find that. You know, <laughs> you know, like it was like a horrible thing. Um, and granted, this was not like my director. <laughs> um, you know, um, it wasn't David or you know, any um, of the people you would spend FaceTime at Papa, but you know, just, it was very, very striking to me um, that people were all, weren't necessarily excited about this, right? Um, so Robert Douglas Jr. Um, is the first African-American artist that Papa shows in 1834. Um, and again, has this sort of familial history to this Benjamin West painting, but of course, when he shows up to come to the exhibition, um, Papa doesn't let him in the door. Right, 40 years later, the same thing happens to Edward Bannister at the Centennial. Um, and so there's this history of racism and you know, the, the kind of staunch traditions um, at PAFA that, um, or like I said, in Philly and at PAFA, um, that I think David Brigham and sort of our new leadership is now starting to kind of go back in mind um, and to really do something about. So in that, I was able to kind of s sift through um, some of our archives and find, you know, this particular photograph of Cyrus Bastille. Um, this is a, a self-portrait of Benjamin West that we have in the collection. Um, this is Sarah Maps Douglas, who was Robert, Robert Douglas Jr.'s sister. Um, this work is actually at the Philadelphia Library Company, but I include her here because she's very, um, you know, important to the overall lineage. This is the portrait of James Fortin. 
um, that's at the Philadelphia Historical Society. Um, and these are just sort of the dots that one can connect between PAFA and the other institutions in the city um, to, may to maybe, you know, possibly put together a, a better history of Douglas's, um, of Douglas's life and his career. So we fast forward to the 70s, 1870s, when Tanner starts at PAFA. Um, his piece, Nicodemus, comes in the, to the collection in 1900. Um, the journals and the letters that the gentleman so eloquently spoke about earlier um, are in the archive and they are accessible, so you can come and pull them out and, 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 and read through them. Um, Tanner is really the only African American artist that we've trained that we've had um, that we have a pretty significant um, archival materials on. Um, I'm currently working on a show right now um, called In Similar Likeness. I just got it approved like a month ago, so I'm super excited about that. <laughs> um, thank you. It looks at May Howard Jackson, Mita Warwick Fuller, Laura Wheeler Warren, and Selma Burke. Um, though Burke didn't go to PAFA, um, I included her because she was very, and I'm pitching them or sort of painting this narrative of them as like the quintessential modernist um, of the early 20th, early to mid 20th century. Um, and interestingly enough, May Howard Jackson was the first black woman to attend PAFA, um, you know, met her right after her. We don't have any of their works in the collection. Um, we're working on a Laura Wheeler wearing, I got my fingers crossed um, on, on that. Um, but I, again, you know, just thought these things were just really, um, really, really problematic. Um, this is just a picture, you know, of Laura and um, the piece that Brooklyn just acquired. Um, another sort of small archive that we have is letters and correspondence between Pathos faculty and what was called the Pyramid Club. And the Pyramid Club was built or established in 1931 or sorry, 1937, by a group of prominent African-American doctors, lawyers, businessmen, and one of those men was Louis Henry Tanner, um, who was uh, Henry Asawa Tanner's um, nephew. Um, Louis Henry Tanner II um, is actually, or sorry, Louis Tanner Moore um, II is on our exhibitions committee. Um, and the Pyramid Club was, again, a social, civic, you know, engagement um, social group that established annual exhibitions for African-American artists in Philly. Um, and in conjunction with PAFA faculty at the time, there was an exchange. So the African-American artists that would show at the Pyramid Club would also then subsequently show at PAFA, and then those works would come into the collection. So through from 1941 to 1957, um, our collection of African-American artists um, grew exponentially. Um, and this is one of our favorites. It's called Yellow Cup by um, Herbert Howard, who was the, who managed the um, the annuals. A next very important a next important figure is Louis B. Sloan. He was the first African American faculty member um, at PAFA, hired in 1962. Um, stayed at PAFA for over 40 years, and with Sloan came African American students like Barclay Hendricks, James, and James Brantley, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But as soon as um, Lewis retired, um, the students pretty much went with him. So from his moment of retiring, literally until about 10 years ago, um, I, secretly I kind of call it Papa's Dark Ages um, <laughs> because we're just, we're nowhere to be found almost. Um, this is um, Barclay, we do have letters and you know, we're starting to kind of get some of his papers um, are, are trickling in. Um, and then another thing that happened very, very quickly um, was in 2014, Harold A. and Ann R. Sorgenti gave their collection of contemporary African-American art, uh, which boosts PAFA's holdings tremendously. This is one of our Benny Andrews um, that's actually up right now in the rotunda. Here's a brief look at our most recent exhibition history in the last five years. I'm sure many of you saw the Norman Lewis show. Um, Path is very, very proud of that show. Everybody really, really is. Ruth just won the um, Bard Award for, from the College Art Association for the catalog. Um, so we're really happy about that. Um, and then here are some current statistics for you. So we have six black members on, on our board, also um, one Asian and two South Asian. Um, 
over 300 works in, in the permanent collection. And you guys you know, can read that. Um, but one of the things that I found was really important was, was Winston and Carolyn Lowe's dedication, um, as well as our board and David's commitment to making this position that I'm currently occupying a pipeline for black curators. So for as long as it's funded, um, it's only for black curators interested in black art. Um, so I'm trying to push them a little bit because I'm like, all oh, black curators may not want to study black art. <laughs> you know, we do like other things. Um, so I'm trying to push them a little bit to kind of um, widen that up. Um, DDA William, practicing, you know, Afri uh, Haitian American art artist is our new MFA um, chair. And Brooke Davis Anderson, which we are so psyched about, is our new museum director. Um, and if anybody um, knows Brooke personally, or if you know anything about her background, um, even as a, um, as a white woman, she has been steeped in African American art um, and the stories of um, African American art historical narratives. Um, it was really interesting because during her job talk, and Brooke is like 6'2", like she's really tall too, um, every example she gave in terms of projects she worked on, artists she was interested in, every single like thing she talked about dealt with African American artists or a black artist to some degree. And some of our board members like eyes were like as big as plates, right? <laughs> and so DDA and David and I were like nudging each other and like super excited and everything. And so our um our admissions counselor, like at the end she said, Well I can tell you you three are really happy. Um and so and we really, really are. Um because it's really a commitment from the top down um at a traditional white institution, which is something you don't necessarily see um, all the time. And it, it's a place that I'm really happy to be at um, because I, I always say David allows me to just kind of talk about it without the filter because um, I can actually say, you know, what the problems are um, and not have that kind of pushback or that like sit down and shut up, you know, you don't really know what you're talking about or don't critique the white people, um, you know, kind of thing. Um, so keep us on your radar, you know, I'm, um, path is really, dedicated you know to filling the spaces and as much as we have to i think you know continue to invest in our own institutions and create our own institutions um the benjamin west robert douglas example i think is a really great example of why we need black scholars in traditionally white institutions um so i would say you know continue to send your students right um to, to traditional museums and traditional um art history departments and schools so to do that research, right? To, to bring our histories um, into the forefront in reference to iconic, you know, American artworks that people don't always think to look for us at. So thank you. <laughs>